Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. Lawrence Feingold. Super excited to be talking about the relationship between Israel and the church. And Dr. Feingold, I have to say that um, when I was first uh, taking steps into the Catholic Church, I was raised Baptist and I converted. Uh, my priest, Father Drew Hoffman, I don't know if that name's familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I had him a student, eight yeah. courses, more or less. <laughs> well, Father Drew Hoffman, he handed me a book um, called uh, Faith Comes from What is Heard. And he's like, you know, Swan, you should uh, read this to get to know Catholicism. And he was talking about like, yeah, and the author is this awesome. Like, yeah, there, there it is. <laughs> and he was saying that the author is like this great guy. And he talked to me about your conversion story. And so, you know, he really looks up to you. And so, Dr. Feingold, I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, could you introduce yourself real quick? Hi, my name is Larry Feingold. And I was brought up a, um, an atheist, Jewish atheist. My dad was Jewish atheist and my mom a fallen away Protestant. And my wife and I um, um, <clears throat> converted to Catholicism by way of the Anglican Church. In um, nine, so we were baptized in the Anglican Church in 1988, together with our baby. And he was just born, and he was a part of the conversion process. Um, it was basically during my wife's pregnancy that um, it, um, she had a lot of anxiety in the pregnancy. One day she said she didn't want to live, and that's what hit me. There had to be, I could see I couldn't love her the way that she needed to be loved. And that if there wasn't God, the father who did that, I, life wouldn't make sense. And I so, so I had to pray and ask him to teach me to love. Anyways, that was the beginning of our conversion. Mm -hmm. I never prayed in my life. After I made that prayer, teach me to love and to be light unto others, I felt the words of the baptism of Jesus, which is also Psalm number two, you are my son and in whom I'm well pleased and this day I've begotten you. Um, and so I knew that, so, and I understood that was being said to Jesus, the son, who I mm -hmm. left completely out of the picture, and, um, and that we had to be Christian. It took us a little while to find the Catholic Church, though, and Cardinal um, John Henry, um, St. John Henry Newman was key in that process. And so now I teach um, Catholic theology at Kenrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, well, Dr. Feingold, we're, you know, we're so gifted to have you in the Catholic Church, and I really appreciate just all the work that you've done. Well, let's get ready to talk about, um, you know, and I'm basing these questions around a three volume series that you did on the mystery of Israel and the church. And actually, I have the three volumes set. Okay. Right. There we go. <laughs> Here's the first one. Right. Anyway, there's. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a, it's a, uh, it's in my house back in uh, Manhattan, Kansas, you know, my college town. So I wish I could bring them up, but I'm glad that you have them handy. Uh, so here's my first question. Right. There's a, uh, is that the third one? Yeah, the third one. Yeah. Throw and on the, that. Yeah, the and, second one is things new and old. Right. Sorry. Okay. All right, Dr. Feingold, here's my first question, right? Just kind of uh, reflecting on the work that you've done. Um, what is the church and what is Israel? I mean, maybe that's the million dollar question, right? right <laughs> to give a proper answer, that'd take us a whole hour. But um, for this purpose of this, above all, I think we can highlight the church, we don't often think of it in this way, but the church is the messianic kingdom of Israel. Right? That's the church, we believe as Catholics, is precisely what God announced and um, in the prophets and prefigured in many, many types and above all in the life of Israel herself um, as, um, as the messianic kingdom of Israel in which God's promises of um, forgiving sin, of giving his grace and giving us the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and in a, a more universal way um, uh, would be realized, All right? So that's, and we can, the church can get, it's a reality that um, is prefigured in many ways in Israel. Mm -hmm. right? So Israel herself being the principal figure. Um, and we can also understand the church as the, um, the body of Christ, he's the head, and all those who are baptized into the body are the members, right? So it's like Israel, the church is a, um, a visible kingdom, right? With visible members who come into that kingdom by baptism and are built up by the other sacraments, confirmation above all the Eucharist mm -hmm. um, and um, structured by holy orders. It's propagated by matrimony. Right? And so it has um, the seven sacraments are what make the kingdom, right? So the kingdom is built up, we could say, like um, the image out of Christ's pierced side on Calvary, mm -hmm. there came forth blood and water, John tells us 
in his gospel. And the fathers of the church saw in that image of the blood and water from Jesus' side, water representing baptism and the blood representing the Eucharist. And thus Jesus is, so like Eve taken from Adam's side, when Adam was sleeping, and, and so the new Eve taken from Christ, the new Adam's side in his sleep of death on, on the cross, his bride is built up by the sacraments. And so the, the um, church is a sacramental kingdom. It's a messianic kingdom, a sacramental kingdom in which there's a visible aspect. And that's what we see. That's the members, the baptized, the hierarchy. And, but also more importantly, an invisible dimension, which is sanctifying grace, faith, hope, and charity, the gifts, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Trinity, and divine sonship received, and forgiveness of sins um, received. And so the church is visible and invisible at one and the same time. A key document on this, by the way, is the Second Vatican Council's Lumen Gentium, mm -hmm. in particular, chapter eight of Lumen Gentium that speaks of the church with these two dimensions, like that of our founder, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, visible in his humanity, invisible in his divinity. All right, it's just an analogy. The church mm -hmm. is not God, um, as, but the church lives the life of her head, who is God made man. Right? And so it's, the church is profoundly communion, communion um, of the members with her head, who is God made man, the word incarnate, and the communion of the members among themselves through faith, hope, and charity, and through the sacramental gifts that we receive in this messianic kingdom. Mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot more that can be said about it. But <laughs> um, so what about Israel? So when we hear the word Israel, we think um, a nation in the Middle East, and that's not what we're, we're talking about principally, right? We're mm -hmm. talking here about a mystery. So the church is a a mystery and and the second Vatican council and that was one of its key i would say um, aims or even um, part of the mission of the second Vatican council was to highlight and to bring again to prominence the idea that the church isn't just simply another institution out there in the world with its own scandals like other institutions but a mystery of faith right this mystery of communion and likewise israel and biblical israel but an israel that continues um, to exist in the world and the Jewish people in covenant with God is also a mystery, right? And so it's a mystery that goes further back in human history and to Abraham. And so God calling Abraham out of Mesopotamia in Genesis chapter 12 and, and, and entering into covenant with Abraham and his children, again, miraculously and so promised by the, the promise that um, Sarah, who was barren and too old, would be fruitful. And then in that line, so in Genesis 12, verses one through four, Abraham receives two promises to be the father of a people um, that would be very great, right? This, like the, the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, but also um, that all nations would be blessed in his offspring, Israel, right? And we see in that promise to Abraham, precisely Israel and the church. First mm -hmm. promise being the people Israel, and the second, the universal blessing of all nations through his descendants in Israel being um, a prophecy about the Messiah and his kingdom um, to be a universal blessing. And so Israel, like the church, has a visible and an invisible dimension, right? The visible dimension is the Israelites were visible, right? And so especially in biblical times, they had their, their visible boundaries, the members who were um, circumcised. So circumcision for men being the visible sign of incorporation into Israel. Right? And then it too had its sacraments. And I guess we'll talk more about that um, further along. So in those sacraments, the first among them being circumcision. Right, by which one was marked as a member of this people. So Israel was visible, it had a priesthood, right? and that's in the line of Aaron, and it had a, um, a whole tribe, the Levites, who served the worship. And um, so in that sense, it had a, um, it was a priestly people having a priestly family and um, tribe. It was also a kingly people, right? Having the kingship in the line of Judah, right? First, 
Saul from Benjamin, but then David and his line in the tribe of Judah. Um, and a people who has received a unique um, worship from God, but above all, a people in whom um, who entered into covenant with God through God's action of election and, and bringing Israel into covenant with himself. And then as a as the, we could say the crowning jewel of that covenant, God residing in the midst of his people um, with a mysterious presence um, that was um, in the center of Israel for her worship, right? So in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Tent of Meeting, which then David brought to Jerusalem and Solomon um, brought into the Holy of Holies of the temple in Jerusalem, right? So it, um, these are all we could call these the glories of Israel, right? All of these um, aspects, the covenant, and then together with the covenant, um, God adopting, right? Abraham and his children to be his own. Um, and thus Israel becomes God's firstborn son, right? So the divine filiation belonged to Israel as right? its glory. The worship given by God, and that we just refer to that as the Torah, Right? That would be the worship and the law together, because it's all part of the way of life of Israel given from above, given by God to Israel to be um, his people. Right? The adoption of sonship as a people and the um, <clears throat> prophets, a whole prophetic line by which revelation continued to grow in Israel, but always to a, um, a particular direction, right? With, and that would be the messianic promise. Right? And so Israel being a people ordered to the coming of the Messiah and thus ordered in some sense beyond itself mm -hmm. to the Messianic kingdom that her whole life prefigured. Right? And so built on the 12 tribes, again, 12, a number of universality, the 12 sons of Jacob, um, again, prefiguring um, the Messianic kingdom for all nations. Right. Well, Dr. Feingold, uh, if I could ask just a brief question, okay. I know that we got a lot of questions, but let me just try oh. to get through this one briefly. And then, you know, we can, mm -hmm. you can go as fast or as slow as you want through okay. some of the other ones. But um, just mentioning also this idea of the kingdom of God, that's very much part of Jesus's uh, theology in the New Testament. Um, would it be fair to say that in some sense, the church is the kingdom of God and in another sense, the kingdom of God is yet to come? Um, great question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Jesus speaks about the kingdom being at hand right. mm -hmm. and being present already in their midst. Um, mm -hmm. Luke. And so, so we don't, it would be a big mistake to think of the kingdom of heaven as something exclusively still to come, right? So the church is that messianic kingdom foretold by the prophets and it's above all a sacramental kingdom, a kingdom in which God reigns, but he reigns through sacramental um, means by which his life is communicated to us, sins are forgiven, and which we can, especially in the Eucharist, return and give glory to him in um, a sacrificial worship, which is not the sacrifice of lambs and bulls, mm -hmm. as in um, the um, Old Testament kingdom of Israel, but now the sacrifice of the Messiah himself, right? the, the word incarnate. And um, so, yes, very much the church is the kingdom of God. And the, we're the members in this kingdom. Mm -hmm. But again, the kingdom is so much bigger than us because the kingdom is principally Jesus in our midst, his indwelling presence and the presence of his grace and the Holy Spirit as the soul of that kingdom, the church. All right. That's and, wonderful. But yes, mm -hmm. still to come, though. And that's why right. we speak of the church having three levels, as it were, the mm -hmm. church militant, the church suffering in purgatory and the church triumphant make up one reality, mm -hmm. the church in the full sense or the kingdom in the full sense, right? And so what we do on earth, say in the liturgy, is um, a partaking of the heavenly liturgy in one and the same church, in the church triumphant, but we're still here in the church militant. All right, Dr. Feingold, here's my next question. So what are the elements of continuity and discontinuity between Israel and the church. We talked a little bit about, you know, the distinctive natures of both, right? But I mean, what continued and what didn't continue? This is a this is also a million dollar question. <laughs> right. So above all, the relationship is one of figure and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And so Israel um, being 
so one way, I think the best way to look at this is starting with, with Christ and the church and the messianic kingdom. In other words, God's ultimate purpose is revealed in, in the end, right? And, and what comes first is understood in the light of that end. Obviously, Jews are, would object to this way of looking at it, but in the light of faith in Christ, that would be the way to see it. And so um, Israel is going to, in that light, is going to be prefiguring and preparing for the messianic kingdom. Right? And prefiguring, well, let's say preparing above all, because the messianic kingdom, we said, centers on God made man. And so centers on the act of the incarnation. And so, but God, when he becomes man, becomes man in a people. And so there has to be a people prepared in whom he's going to be a family, a language, a culture. And so Israel is above all going to be in continuity with the Messiah by being that family formed by God in a way proper to God, that is not just one generation, two generations, but 2,000 years, right? So form, um, um, so that would be the, so Israel as the preparation to be the people in whom he will be, become man. And, and that means applies also a mother. We'll, I think, come back to her in a later question mm -hmm. from that people. And we could say that the people and that mother share the same mission, to be um, that family in whom God becomes man. Um, and part of that preparation is going to be um, prophecy and revelation. Right? So that's obviously in continuity. The church receives all of that revelation about God's inner life, God's plan, and God's covenant, God's law that he revealed to Israel. So that's a, obviously a gigantic. Um, so we'd say the first continuity is the very people in whom God becomes man. Mm -hmm. And then a second continuity, um, the whole revelation about who God is, what that plan is, right? In other words, who is the God who will become man in that people? And what is his plan for mankind and for, um, and for his people? And so God's progressive revelation, right? So revelation continually progressing, but reaching its culmination when God himself becomes man, right? So in Christ is the culmination of revelation and it's crowning and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And, and then he reveals a worship for that people, right? And so that's also in continuity, but continuity and discontinuity. Continuity in that the worship of that, of, of Israel had elements that, um, um, so elements that are universal, and that is worship, prayer, the Psalms, right? Ways of praying God that we continue to use in the church in complete continuity, right? The divine office takes all of those Psalms of Israel and continues to pray them every day. Um, but the element of discontinuity is two different sacramental economies, mm -hmm. right? So the sacraments of the Old Testament and the sacraments of the New Covenant, right? Um, and so what do I mean by that? Um, we tend to, so Catholics are familiar with the seven sacraments of the church, but not with sacraments of the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. But the great theologians, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and we could say the whole patristic and scholastic tradition spoke of sacraments of the old covenant, right? and the most kind of visible and obvious being circumcision. Mm -hmm. But other sacraments would be the, the Passover, the Paschal Lamb, um, all the different sacrifices of the old law um, and belong to the worship of the old covenant. And even um, aspects such as um, baptisms. So there were in the old covenant, there were ritual immersions um, by which one was cleansed of ritual um, impurity. Mm -hmm. so that would be a kind of sacrament of the old covenant. Um, and um, anointing with oil. Anointing, yeah. So the anointing of the kings of Israel above all, right? So we see Samuel anointing Saul and David um, and their sons, David's sons, that is. Um, and then the anointing of the high priest. Um, and also, there's a, a prophetic anointing, Elisha um, anointing um, Elisha, Elijah, sorry, anointing Elisha. And, um, and so in that sense, the anointing in Israel prefiguring um, confirmation and um, the anointing in, in the church. Um, so a sacramental worship, and so that would be in continuity, but the discontinuity would be new sacraments that have a new power that's coming from the fact that God has become man and now is acting through the sacraments of the new covenant in a way that the old covenant couldn't. 
because God hadn't yet become man. So, and so in the old covenant, the sacred sacraments we can understand in a broad sense as sacred signs. That's the Augustinian definition. Sacred signs given by God for worship, worship and sanctification. And so Israel had these sacred signs from God through the covenant right, given by Moses and before that circumcision to Abraham. Um, and they were signs, sacred signs of worship to him and of his blessing. Right? And signs that would prefigure the seven sacraments of the church. Right? So circumcision prefiguring baptism, the anointings prefiguring confirmation, and the uh, Passover prefiguring the Eucharist, and the priesthood in the Old Testament prefiguring the priesthood in the new, matrimony in the old prefiguring matrimony in the new. And so that would be the element of continuity. But the discontinuity here is that in the new covenant, we say that the sacraments work ex opere operato, sorry, Latin phrase, meaning from the work done. What work? All right, the work of the, the sacrament of celebration, but above all behind that, the work of Christ on Calvary, mm -hmm. right? So God made man and becomes the true sacrifice. True sacrifice in this sense, not that the sacrifice of Israel weren't truly sacrifices, but true sacrifice in the sense that a sacrifice aims to offer honor and glory to God and to make satisfaction for sin by offering something more pleasing than sin is displeasing. All right. The sacrifice of a lamb or bull can't do either of them. They can't honor God as he should be honored, nor can it offer God more pleasing um, satisfaction than sin is, human sin is displeasing. But God made man offering himself to the end on Calvary can and did, right? Is the true sacrifice. Um, and so then the new covenant is gonna be built on Christ's sacrifice, as we said before, right? The water and blood coming out of Christ's side. And so the new covenant has a sacramental economy that has, is in profound continuity, but discontinuously, maybe discontinuous is not the right word here, and fulfillment in fulfillment has a power um, that comes from Calvary, a power to forgive sins and to give graces that Christ merited for us, and a power that also involves Jesus speaking through the sacraments of the new covenant, words of power proper to God made man. Mm. This is my body and this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and even the, I baptize you, that's, we want to think the Messiah working, right, through those words, mm -hmm. bringing us into the communion of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, Dr. Feingold, um, you know, we had it lower down on the roster that we talked about the sacraments uh -huh. in the Old Testament yeah. and the uh, the Jewish and Jewish tradition, but I think we can actually just hit that now. I okay. think you've already right. touched on it, right, but yeah. I mean, is there more that we can kind of uh, dig into here? Right. So in Jewish theology, they won't speak of, right? So they don't right. have that category mm -hmm. of sacraments. That's a category developed in the, in the church and translating the Greek word mysterion, mystery. And so the Jews don't have that word or terminology, but they have the reality. And that reality, they would just simply be aspects of the Torah, right? Mm -hmm. The Torah, which gives Israel its unique way of worshiping God. And so we would say that way of worshiping is profoundly sacramental in that God gave to Israel sacred signs that are mysterious. Mysterious here in the sense, above all, pointing beyond themselves in a ways that couldn't fully be understood before what they pointed to came to be. And that is the incarnation and his passion and resurrection. So yes, Israel has a sacramental economy, we could say, meaning a way of worshiping God through sacred signs given by him, right? And that's a glory. Um, and those sacred signs prefiguring. And yeah, this gets worked out in, in a terminology, above all by St. Augustine, who speaks of the sacraments of the old covenant, the sacraments of the new, and the distinction between them. And that gets developed and perfected in many ways by the great scholastics, and especially Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. So Thomas Aquinas in his Summa, has a, a little red section, which is marvelous, on the old law, right? So it's in the prima secunde of the Summa, the moral treatise, not where you would expect to right, find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So it's in the moral treatise, and it's in the section on law, right, where he goes through the mm -hmm. explaining the Ten Commandments, the law of God, natural law. 
Um, but he, he speaks of also revealed law, positive law, right? Revealed by God, and which is twofold, the law of the old covenant and the law of the new covenant. And um, the law of the new covenant is above all the gift of, of the Holy Spirit through the sacraments that um, writes the written law in our hearts. And, and in the old covenant, the, um, we could say the old law is both the, um, the moral law, making explicit the moral law, but also a moral law um, involving how Israel was to worship God. Mm -hmm. And so part of that worship is its sacramental worship in the sense of through the rites that God gave to Israel. So in that section, St. Thomas um, explores the, um, the sacraments of the old covenant. We're using the word analogously, right? So meaning it's a um, similar definition, but not exactly the same. And what's different, so in both cases, sacred signs given by God to sanctify his people and to worship him. And the difference is that for the New Testament sacraments, we say in addition to that, they give the grace that they represent by, and by the power of the one who works through them. And that is the Messiah, God made man, who speaks through the sacred minister, right? Through the ordained minister or in. All right, so that would, so yes. And, and we can say Israel has a sacramental economy, but that sacramental economy is prefiguring uh, the, the sacramental economy of the new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really fascinating to see like how you are, you know, comparing Israel and the church by really drawing upon the sacraments. Uh, I know that like most other Protestants might point to, I mean, they would say that, oh, we've done away with the rituals, right? And we just have Jesus now or something like that, you know? Um, but I think what you're saying is at least how we as Catholics view it is very much a continuity with subtleties, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. A continuity, but with this, well, the, the great event <laughs> of God entering into history in the midst precisely of Israel. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and thus transforming that sacramental economy in a so that he's going to work through it now and mm -hmm. so yes he has to institute new sacraments and among those sacraments is going to be a new priesthood but sure that priesthood is modeled on the priesthood of israel even to the extent of three grades of holy orders mm -hmm. and so in israel you had the high priest and um, the oldest son of aaron and, and descendant and um, then all the other priests the other descendants of aaron and then the levites who served the priests um, in the tabernacle, in the liturgy and sacred music, um, in the artistic, um, in the work of the temple. And so in the church, we likewise have um, three levels of holy orders, bishop, priest, and deacon. So the mm -hmm. deacon um, being parallel to the Levite, right? the priest being parallel to the priest of Israel, and the bishop to the high priest. Right? And so every local church having uh, one bishop representing the high priest and of course jesus the eternal high priest working through all mm -hmm. he remains the one eternal high priest in the new covenant right in the order of melchizedek right, right. yeah right. right to distinguish it again so the letter to the hebrews is a key text here right. to kind of develop the the continuity and the discontinuity in the sense of the new testament having a higher form of worship because God made man is acting through it in a way that he couldn't before he had come, right? Before he'd been made man. Right. My, I mean, my next question is, you know, I, I, you know, I've done a lot of work myself in the Isaiah 22, Matthew 16, okay. 19 parallel, and as have many others, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, Steve Ray and a whole bunch of mm -hmm. others, Scott Hahn, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I, I, if you, you know, if you accept the parallel, or at least if you see the force of it, it would seem to imply that, even Jesus had modeled the church after the Davidic kingdom to some extent, right? And so this would, could be another point of even greater continuity than maybe some had previously anticipated. Um, what are your thoughts on um, whether uh, the extent to which the church is modeled after Israel, at least in this regard, in, in the Davidic kingdom, the Davidic nature of it? Um, well, so in the new, the new, um, the messianic kingdom, right, mm -hmm. the church, Jesus remains always the prophet, priest, and king, right? So in the right. new covenant, he is um, um, he is the Davidic king, right? He is the high priest who acts um, in every sacramental celebration. And he is the prophet with a capital P, the new Moses prepared for in Deuteronomy 18. So, in, and, but because he ascends to heaven 40 days after his resurrection, 
he needs um, his body needs some kind of visible um, yeah, minister, prime minister, who doesn't take the place of our Davidic King Jesus, mm -hmm. but who um, um, is a principle of unity of his church on earth, right? And yes, we see that in the 12 apostles and in a particular way in Peter, the head of that apostolic college. And that was meant to last throughout history such that the church is governed, yes, by the bishops in every place, each one um, the high priest of the local church, but brought into unity through a principle of unity, the successor of Peter, who's the Bishop of Rome. And, and so the same structure we see in the New Testament of apostles and um, together with Peter, but Peter being in some way, having a, a role of headship, that to be perpetuated in the church. Yes, and that's prefigured in some way in, in Isaiah 22. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and um, you know, just speaking about um, now the Messiah himself, Right. So, I mean, as Christians, we often use the term um, maybe. Um, well, I don't think we use it improperly. Right. But mm -hmm. th there's a whole richness to what that idea actually is that I think might often go underappreciated. And so could you explain just like, you know, what is the idea of the Messiah in, in, in uh, Judaism or the Old Testament? And then even according to the, uh, the various traditions, you know, I, I know, like, I think Qumran and other places talk about a, a messianic figure. I'm not sure if that's quite accurate, but you know, in Jewish tradition, certainly an idea. Right. Yeah, fantastic. So that's a, a to answer that properly, we would be this whole <laughs> hour and a lot more. So I'm um, I'm doing it. Um, for me, I, can I refer the reader to something? So yeah, I of have course, a, yeah. doing a series um, that one can find in the um, website of the Association of Hebrew Catholics on um, the Messiah of Israel and, and based on Christology. And we did four sessions of an hour on that question about the Messiah. But here's the short answer. And the messianic expectation was planted by God in the people of Israel in a progressive way, right? So its first seed is in Genesis 12 with Abraham, as I mentioned before, right? That he would be the father of great people, but a blessing for all nations. So already there, there's a messianic aspect, even though a particular figure isn't directly named. Prior to that, it's already illumined um, alluded to in Genesis 3.15, right after the fall, God's punishment on Satan, the serpent, is enmity with a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and we take that to mean a, the, the mother of the Messiah. And, and her seed would crush Satan's head, but he would bruise his heel. Right? And so we take that as a, um, a prophecy, again, understandable only fully in hindsight, of um, Mary. Jesus crushing Satan's head and being crushed in the process in his humanity on the cross. All right. This um, now moving into the life of Israel, um, it, we get a certain development of it in, in simply the passing on of the blessing from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Right. So there's a whole um, series of prophecies about the lineage. Right. Precisely, all nations are going to be blessed in whom? Isaac, not Ishmael. And so Isaac then re receives these promises. And, but God asks Abraham to sacrifice that very Isaac in whom the promises lie. And so Abraham is believing that God will be faithful, even to the point of raising, being able to raise up Isaac from the dead, um, as Hebrews chapter 11 interprets that. And Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau, who gets the blessing. That's the whole story of Genesis right, about Jacob and Esau, the fighting over the blessing, Esau selling the blessing for a plate of lentils, and Jacob getting the, um, the blessing with the help of Rebecca, et cetera. And, um, and, but Jacob has now, so Jacob gets the blessing, and Jacob has 12 sons to become the 12 um, sons of Israel. So another, miss, I'm sorry, this is going to take too long, but. No, you're good. Another, <laughs> another um, key prophecy is Genesis 49, where Jacob blesses his 12 sons, who will get the messianic blessing? We might expect the firstborn. We might expect Joseph, the dreamer, the hero. We might expect Benjamin, the last and beloved son. But no, it's the fourth son, Judah. We don't know why. And um, in so Genesis 49, 10, sovereignty will go be in the line of Judah, right? As it was, David is from Judah, Davidic kingship, um, and will not um, be lost until he comes to whom it belongs, mm. the scepter, right? The scepter won't depart. And so, again, that's an image now of a kingly Messiah, 
um, the Messiah as rightfully king and who will come before all sovereignty is lost to Israel. And all right, hundreds of years pass, new prophecies come up in the exile, it's in the uh, Exodus. And the key one is Moses with a different dimension and speaks of a, a prophet like me, it's Deuteronomy 18. And him you shall heed. Right? And so again, if we flesh that out, what would that look like? Another prophet in the future like Moses. Well, Moses sealed a covenant. This future prophet would seal a new covenant. Moses liberated the people from Pharaoh. The new prophet would likewise accomplish um, liberation, right? But again, in hindsight, we know liberation from sin and death. Um, and revelation through Moses, revelation through Christ, etc. Sacraments through Moses, sacraments through Christ. This new so that's a, a key prophecy. Christ as the new Moses. Um, there's the Star of David, that's Balaam's prophecy, seeing something not close. And, and again, the idea of the obedience of the peoples. And so similar to Genesis 12 in that sense. And skipping ahead another 400 years, the next key prophecy is the prophecy of the prophet Nathan to David. David has brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. David's living in a palace and the Ark of the Covenant in a tent. And that's not fitting. And David wants to build a a house for the Lord. And he tells Nathan, his prophet, that. And Nathan says, yes, the Lord is with you. Go ahead. Goes to sleep on it. And the Lord tells him, no, it won't be David. And every, the roles get reversed. So this is the prophecy of Nathan in um, 2 Samuel 7, 14, if I'm getting that right. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and this is a key for so many future prophets. So this is like a, um, a prophecy that many, many other prophecies are going to take as their launch pad, as it were. And so God reverses the roles. I will build a house for you. And that house is your descendants after you, your dynasty. And, and from your offspring, there will be one who will build a temple for me. And we think Solomon. And it's true, he does build the temple. But then the prophecy is too big for Solomon. I will be his father. He will be my son. And, and his throne will be eternal mm -hmm. and have an everlasting kingship. And so these are the key elements of this Davidic prophecy, that in David's line, there will be a future king who will decisively build the temple. All right, Solomon built the temple, but that temple got destroyed in the Babylonian exile. All right, it got rebuilt, but then destroyed again. Mm -hmm. And Christ, of course, says, my body is the true temple, right? And so Christ fully realizes that aspect of building the temple. And of course, it's the Holy Spirit building the temple in Mary's womb. The very humanity of the word is the true temple. And then, of course, he has a kingship that is everlasting. And he is the son of the father in a unique way, right? And speaks of God as his father, et cetera. So Jesus, so this is typical of many, this is what makes biblical prophecy very difficult, is that biblical prophecy um, had partial fulfillments that were proximate, right? Solomon. And we many, so along that line, so a few centuries further along, um, Isaiah gives a prophet, prophecy to one of David's descendants, Ahaz, right? Who is being threatened by a plot um, to remove the Davidic line. And so God um, says to, to Isaiah to say to Ahaz, ask for a sign. And yes, I won't ask, right? And so God gives the sign, a virgin will conceive and bear and he shall be the Emmanuel, right? Isaiah 7, 14. And, um, and so that's, um, again, two, interesting is two parts, virgin birth, that's what we think of, but more important there is the Emmanuel, God with us. And so again, the Messiah having this new aspect of the Lord's dwelling in the midst of his people, as he had did in the temple, right? With this, what Jews call the Shekinah, the glory cloud descending. And so the Messiah also, and the Messianic prophecies have this aspect of the true dwelling of God with his people. Right? So that's a whole nother dimension of it. That again, um, so partial realization, King Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, good king, but um, he's not Emmanuel, nor is his mother uh, have a virgin birth. But um, and many other prophecies along this line that maybe I'll just skip over. So other, Jeremiah, Ezekiel developed the son of David, right? So there's a whole series of son of David prophecies that speak of the Davidic 
messianic king um, who will rule a universal kingdom. Right? And so that the key features of this messianic line of prophecies is um, a kingship that is um, um, universal in time and space. Um, an interesting, uh, do I have time to keep on going on this? Or oh, no, you you're good. So like we can uh, go to like, you know, like uh, 230 central. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me do two more aspects of this. Sure. You get the, the kingship, but so this kingship, the messianic kingship gets further developed. So the king is also shepherd, right? So there are a whole series of prophecies, Ezekiel in particular, that develops this David, my shepherd, who will shepherd my people. Well, it's interesting because it's God who shepherds the people, mm -hmm. and yet it's David who will shepherd. God who is the king, and yet David, this future David, will be the king. So the Messiah and God, even though the Messiah isn't directly said to be God, he is spoken of in a way proper to God's role to come visit his people, to shepherd his people, and to be king over his people in the messianic kingdom. And, and then there's a, a sacramental dimension to it. And so a series of prophecies, um, Jeremiah 31, 31, or is it 33? Oh, I'm getting confused here. But in any case, Jeremiah has a prophecy of the new covenant um, that speaks of, um, so a, a new covenant in which the law would be written on the heart. Um, and the forgiveness of sins given. Right? And so we take that to be a prophecy about the messianic kingdom that has a sacramental economy, right, with baptism and working the forgiveness of sins, confirmation, giving the gifts by which wisdom and understanding are um, written on the heart. Um, precisely those interior gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then Ezekiel 36 speaks of an ingathering of Israel right, from exile. Ezekiel's writing during the exile. Um, an ingathering in which there would be a washing with, with clean water mm -hmm. that would wash away sins and win the forgiveness of sins. And likewise, the spirit being given um, and written on the heart and um, giving us hearts rather than stones, etc. And so again, that prophecy seems to be speaking of the messianic kingdom as a sacramental kingdom. And Daniel has a magnificent series of prophecies, mm -hmm. which were maybe the most um, um, very much in people's minds in Jesus' own lifetime, right? Because Daniel's a later prophet and they're very kind of graphic and, and powerful and unforgettable prophecies. So Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven speak of four world empires. Right? So in Daniel two, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream um, of a statue with gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Um, and Daniel interprets the dream as being four world emperors, empires, and then a stone not cut by human hands hits the statue. On its feet of iron, the statue shatters, blown away like chaff, but that stone not cut by human hands grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth. Mm -hmm. You should make a connection here with those messianic Davidic prophecies, right, about the Davidic kingship that um, is universal in time and place, right? And so that's the stone not cut by human hands, right, the Emmanuel that comes and initiates a kingdom in a particular time, right, the time of the Iron Empire. Well, what's the Iron Empire? Rome, right, Rome being that empire that ruled, right, the, the Mediterranean world most strongly with a rod of iron, as it were. And in fact, right, Jesus came during the period of Roman world domination, right? The first Caesar Augustus. Mm -hmm. um, and then another, so that would be the Davidic kingdom. And that also comes out in Daniel 7, which speaks of four kingdoms, four monsters. And um, the, um, the Messiah would be one like a son of man mm -hmm. who is seen on the clouds of heaven, to whom the Ancient of Days gives all dominion, glory, power over all nations and peoples. Right? And so Jesus in the gospels, how does he speak of himself? The son of man, right? Daniel 7, 14, 13 and 14. And, and that's what he's referring to, right? Precisely this messianic king. 
And yes, this expectation now is very much alive. It becomes more and more alive as Israel's temporal fortunes decrease, right? And that makes sense. And so the messianic expectation is much greater after the loss of the Davidic kingship in the Babylonian exile, and still more so and under the Maccabean period, right? The Maccabean and the um, persecution of Antiochus, and, um, and then grows still more under the Roman dominion, right? Which makes perfect sense. And so there's a much greater kind of pitch of messianic expectation in Jesus' time. Part of that also had to do with Daniel 9. Now, I can't really go into that, but <laughs> Daniel 9 is a very interesting prophecy in which it, it speaks of, um, Daniel is meditating in exile. Jeremiah spoke of 70 years of exile. Daniel's praying for redemption of Israel. And the angel Gabriel is sent him and speaks of 70 times seven. Right, 70 years was the time of the exile, but 70 times seven mm -hmm. is the time until the anointed one, Messiah, comes and puts a, um, an end to iniquity and redeems Israel right, from iniquity and, um, and puts a seal on all prophecy and revelation. Um, and so again, this set a certain kind of time frame, 490 years, so roughly 500 years from the order to rebuild Jerusalem, which we read about, by the way, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah right in the middle of the fifth century BC. And one last aspect of Messianic prophecies, really hard to put together with all the others, is the suffering servant mm -hmm. line. Right? So there's a whole line of Messianic prophecies about redemptive suffering, sacrificial outpouring, um, of the, and so the key text being um, Isaiah 53. And the end of Isaiah 52 speaks of the glory, and then Isaiah 53, the, um, the self-emptying of the suffering servant, but at the end, his um, winning um, redemption, ransom for those held under the power of Satan. And then we can put that, the suffering servant line of prophecies together with Psalm 22, um, the second chapter of wisdom, um, and certain um, prophecies in, um, in Zechariah as well. I will strike the, the shepherd and the sheep will be uh, dispersed. Um, and the slain Messiah in Daniel 9. So there's a whole series of another line of, that's really hard from the Jewish point of view. How do you put this together? Davidic king who has a universal rule and a suffering servant who is slain and who's poured out for the sins of his people. But in Jesus, it all comes together, right? But you can see how the Jewish tradition would have had difficulty with this. And so they often speak of two messiahs, right? Yeah. right? A messiah who would be um, of the line of um, um, Judah, right? So a, a Davidic messiah, and then a messiah son of Joseph, or in, in some, so that would be the kind of the rabbinical version, who would be more the warrior messiah who would prepare for the Davidic messiah. And in Qumran, what we see is a priestly messiah, and then a warrior messiah. Um, because it, how can, it seems that the prophecies can't come together in one person. And the secret of how they come together mm -hmm. is the resurrection. Again, the, so the two unthinkable things, a Messiah who's crucified and the Messiah who rises before the general resurrection at the end. Right? And that's what enables all of these prophecies to come together in one, um, Jesus, our Lord. Dr. Feingold, that was just so epic. I, I enjoyed every second of that. <laughs> That's beautiful. But okay, so I mean, Dr. Feingold, this is so beautiful. This is so good, right? But why did some of Jesus' own countrymen reject him then? Um, well, okay, sure, because this yeah. is shocking, right? <laughs> but, I mean, it's the whole, it's the incarnation is right, an infinite self-emptying. And the particular incarnation that God actually chose was incarnation. So Philippians chapter two, incarnation in the sense of becoming man in the midst of Israel, all right, that's somewhat glorious, but um, taking a, a self-emptying to, to the end, right? So as to be that suffering servant offering, um, offering himself for the sins of the whole world. That, um, that is not something that we can just, um, invent in advance right or think that god that would be appropriate or fitting for god to do that's good that is the most shocking thing right that god wants to lower himself to become man in the first place and if he does that not to rule in glory 
but to be crucified. All right, so that's unthinkable. And so we should not blame anyone else for not for having trouble in wrapping their minds about that, but rather we should think that we too would have had trouble with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then likewise, the I mean, yes, the resurrection is the capstone. That's what makes it understandable how he can be both glorious and suffering. But that too was not, um, there wasn't an expectation. Yes, yeah. Jews did, right? So we see in the gospel, in the New Testament, especially through Paul, that the, the Pharisees, this is their glory, were expecting the general resurrection, right? They believed in the general resurrection. We see it in Daniel chapter 12. Um, but um, that this would happen to one, the Messiah, in advance of everyone else, that was not something anyone was expecting. Um, so all of this is the most mysterious and unexpected. And um, uh, yeah, so that I think it's perfectly understandable that in all times and places, the, the wisdom of God looks like folly mm -hmm. and therefore will be rejected. And then a whole other part of it is that um, the disposition of the heart is key in coming to faith as well. In other words, what do I think a Messiah ought to look like? <laughs> And I think most of us want to think that a Messiah ought to look like glory, but that the Messiah would be crucified and want to, to redeem us in that way. That's revealing God's love in a way that, um, yeah. So it, it's, it requires his grace to come to see in what he's done, the greatest motive for faith, mm. right? That loving us to the end. Yeah, I mean, even Peter, right, struggled to accept that Jesus sure. was going to be crucified, right? <laughs> hey, Lord, first messianic prophecy, right after he gets everything right, right? You are the, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, right? You are Peter, etc. Jesus makes the first prophecy of that right then, and he does, that's, again, there's a reason why Jesus does that. He doesn't want Peter and the apostles to misunderstand the nature of his messiahship in the simply Davidic glory and um, kingship line. Right. And to miss the suffering servant line. Mm. And you can see Peter is all too ready to miss that. Yeah. And we are too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and just to reflect on, um, you know, the, the Jewish context of the New Testament, obviously there seems to be this idea of this oral law or this oral teaching passed down from the fathers. And I, you write about this in, in your book as well. And I think you even liken mm -hmm. it to how the church has the written Torah, you know, the scriptures right. and the oral Torah, the apostolic tradition, right? But I mean, could you explain that relationship and just what is the written versus oral Torah? Okay, so the written Torah would be the books of the Old Testament, right, that are inspired and we recognize as does Israel. And the oral Torah is the oral tradition governing its interpretation, right? And so um, that oral Torah was, um, would have been passed down and and oral, so oral Torah has, um, it's oral as opposed to being written inspired form, but it's also developing. That's the key thing. So that oral Torah is something that grows with the life of Israel as they come to see more precisely God's plan for them. And so um, and it's, it's parallel, I'd say exactly, analogically parallel to what we call tradition. And it would have been tradition in that first part of revelation in the um, up, up, up to the time of Christ. And um, now, um, yes, and so, for example, um, Jewish theologians like Jacob Neusner, Jacob Neusner is, um, he's written like 600 books and he's written extensively on the Talmud and, and rabbinical Judaism and its structure. And he sees the, and this would just be common really, not peculiar just I think to Jacob Neusner, but to Orthodox Judaism in general that um, Judaism is built on both pillars, a written Torah and the oral tradition of how to put that in practice. Because if you don't have a tradition of how to live it, um, it won't be life, right? And God's covenant is meant to mold life, both old covenant and new covenant. And so in the church, it's likewise. We, the church's life is built on sacred scripture, inspired, so that'd be the Old and New Testament, right? So we, we add the New Testament there. Um, and on oral tradition, which likewise um, includes the Old Testament traditions like belief in the resurrection, many other things, right, that were part of the oral, 
tradition of the old covenant. And, and but above all, it's and what Jesus taught, right? So for example, in the road to Emmaus, and right, Jesus opened up the scriptures for the two um, on the way to Emmaus, right? And their hearts burned as Jesus showed how he realized the scriptures. That we see right there, oral tradition, the oral tradition of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. and, and we see the key function of it. And it's to be the key of interpretation of the written scriptures, right? Now, we don't have the text of what Jesus said on the way to Emmaus, nor do we have the text of what he said in the upper room that same night when he did the same thing to the 12, to the 11, right, opening up the scriptures. But that's precisely the first and most important role of tradition with a capital T in the life of the church, to be the key to understanding the scriptures, but a key that also involves the whole life of the new, of the church, and thus her worship, um, uh, and a, a faith that is able to develop, a tradition that develops over time, such that we can have our catechism today thicker than would have been possible right in the first second century or second century. Um, yeah, so in that, that's another beautiful continuity that mm -hmm. um, the people of God needs both a written Torah and an oral Torah. And of course, in the church, we need a third thing, and that is a living magisterium. So we can speak of a, the, those three together being like a three-legged stool that is solid. Um, Scripture, tradition with a capital T, and um, a living magisterium, right? And if you just have two, it's going to fall over. And if you just have one, it'll spin around. <laughs> so in the church, we have these three. Yeah, and you know, like in, in some of my own research too, I've, I've compared the magisterium to, you know, how the rabbis and um, I would argue even the sages talk about Deuteronomy 17, 8 to 13, when Moses installs the courts of Israel. You know, and so, I mean, even Israel had something, I mean, it very much had a judicial structure. By the time of Jesus, it was the Sanhedrin. Um, so even that could be uh, at least prefigured um, in Judaism. Would you, would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, so there's something analogous to a magisterium, but yeah, not yeah. with the, um, the particular, so again, mm -hmm. continuity, but a discontinuity would be just as we saw in the sacraments of the new covenant, mm -hmm. there's a new element, this, they give grace from their own power, the power of Jesus that speaks through them. So in the magisterium of the new covenant, there's the charism of infallibility, which we wouldn't want to, we'd want to say Israel as a whole is infallible, right, in her life, but any particular um, school wouldn't have that charism. Mm -hmm. But the new covenant um, receives that gift because it, it's the definitive, right, public revelation has now come to an end. And the task of the church is to conserve that mm -hmm. and to enable that to grow in, in this organic way as the tradition develops and to transmit it to all times and places. All right, Dr. Feingold, let me just ask you a few more questions and then we'll, 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 wrap, we'll try to wrap this up. All right, so um, let's see here. Uh, I want to hit maybe question number eight. We can we can even do seven with this one, but okay, or I'll right. combine them together, right? So yeah, the, the first question number seven is just okay. So has the church replaced Israel? And then the second question is, what is God's plan for the Jewish people now? Okay, yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so we don't want to say that the church has replaced Israel, mm -hmm. given everything we've set up to now, right. and that's simply because the logic of the relationship of Israel and the church isn't um, two things on the same level that one takes the place of the other, right? Like even, I don't know, um, one generation taking the place of the previous generation, but rather the relationship is of type and fulfillment or figure and fulfillment, preparation and fulfillment. And so that which fulfills doesn't replace, it fulfills. Right? So that's a different relationship. And so the, the replacement doesn't in any way adequately represent the right relationship between Israel and the church. And it would, could be very harmful to see it in two kind of opposite ways. It would, so harmful because you could think that the church is something just the same more or less, but taking its place so that now the old covenant people wouldn't be under a covenant anymore. And so the way this often was thought of in among Christians is, and with the crucifixion of Christ, the old covenant is revoked and the Jewish people are cursed and under this curse for the last 2000 years. 
And that has been a cause of much anti-Semitism, right, in theology and in life. And, and that is not at all, right, the right way to think of this for all kinds of reasons. The most important, because God is faithful, even when we're unfaithful. And he's, what he does doesn't, so just as none of us are going to get annihilated, our souls that he's made are made to live forever. And God's covenant also isn't meant to be annihilated. And so the old covenant doesn't get revoked because God is faithful, right? And the key biblical witness to this is in the letter to the Romans. And God is faithful. So Paul poses this question, by no means, he answers, right? God is faithful. And it comes up again in, in Romans 11, and 28 and 29, God's promises are irrevocable or irrevocable. And so his election, he doesn't revoke. And the church in the Second Vatican Council simply quoted Romans 11, 29, and in the document Nostra Etate um, on relations with non-Christian religions, maybe not a adequate title for speaking of Judaism, but in any case, it has its number, um, paragraph four of that document, Nostra Etate, that speaks of um, precisely this question. And there the church makes it clear that the old covenant has not been revoked. And since that Second Vatican Council, um, John Paul II made that clearer still. And um, in, in um, Benedict the Sixteenth and Pope Francis have reiterated the same teaching. Right? So the old covenant has not been revoked. And so we should not think that the church replaces Israel. And that's contrary to the church's magisterium. Um, and all right, it's not infallible magisterium, but it's ordinary magisterium of the church. And we um, need to give our religious submission of mind and will to that teaching. But it also makes sense because of that principle, God is faithful. And so what he's done in the Messianic kingdom doesn't replace it, but it's elevated to a, a different level, right? It's, it transcends it in precisely the way that we've said up till now, above all, by its sacramental economy in which the word incarnate, God made man, is at work acting through those seven sacred signs that are the seven sacraments of the church. Right? So, above, so the church doesn't replace Israel. And that means then that, this would be question eight, I suppose, that God still has a plan for the Jewish people. Right? So this is very important. That, um, and how should we understand that? Well, the, I think we have to look at what, his, so his plan is that I think that they exist um, until the end of time, until he returns. God doesn't want his, the people of Israel um, that he entered into covenant with to, to disappear from the face of the earth. And I think we can see that simply in the history from Abraham, right? That they're still here. Where are the other people who were the inhabitants of Canaan, right? The, all of those Jebusites and other ites. Um, whereas Israel now for 19 centuries was without a homeland, without a place, scattered throughout the world, um, persecuted one place, fled to another, persecuted there, fled to another. Um, the Holocaust, the, the Shoah, and, and then now they, yes, there is the state of Israel, but um, in some ways that's miraculous, right? And so I think we can see in that very history, a plan of God that his chosen people not disappear because they have a witness to give to all times and places. And that witness is precisely of the, um, the plan of the incarnation, the plan of him choosing, his choosing this people in which he would come to dwell, choosing this people to be a blessing on all the nations of the earth. And so that mission, that prophetic mission endures, a mission to be, and simply even to reveal his Torah, right? A key, his worship and, and um, the prophets, and the patriarchs, the lineage, all of those things that we sp spoke about, the messianic preparation. Israel remains a perpetual witness to that. Um, in, even when they don't believe that Jesus has come as the Messiah, but more so when they do, right? And so I think that in, in the people, so people of Israel has this witness to the end of time. And in that people Israel, those who are also believers in Jesus and Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel. And so they have a special role. So that's why there's, and so I'm a member of the Association of Hebrew Catholics. Right? We think that there's a special mission um, for Jews who come to 
um, through the grace of God, come to faith in, in Jesus Yeshua as the Messiah. And then other, um, those who don't make it into the Catholic Church, they're Messianic Jews and um, those in the Protestant um, um, ecclesial communities and the Eastern Orthodox, who likewise, um, from the circumcision, have come to recognize Jesus. And so um, God doesn't want his people to disappear, mm -hmm. but rather to come to faith in him, to give witness. But even in not yet coming to faith, they continue to give witness and have a prophetic role. Wow. Yeah, so when you say like the old covenant isn't revoked, um, it's this idea that um, even the Jewish people in some, uh, in some way still can reflect um, or, or be a witness to the, the, the faithfulness and glory of God. Totally, mm -hmm. totally, right? And, and we see this in there, you know, simply, I saw so an anecdote. And as an atheist, I used to live on the Upper and West Side in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And we would go on Saturday sometimes to the park and it would be filled with these Orthodox Jewish families in their, you know, Sabbath best. And the kids playing wildly. And just this, there was just a contagious atmosphere of joy and celebration and, and contemplation and play. And, and I mean, so the fidelity of the chosen people to the covenant, and things like the Sabbath mm -hmm. and their worship, that is, um, yes, that, that's a prophetic sign. Um, and then, of course, likewise, when Jewish people come to recognize Jesus, that too becomes a, a different kind of um, prophetic sign. Um, of the fulfillment of that people's destiny. Yeah. And even like, um, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this channel, but there's a guy called the Jewish Catholic, uh, Daniel, Daniel um, Suazo, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name or Suazo. It's either one of the two. Um, oh, not familiar. Yeah, but he's also like a Catholic convert from Judaism. And, you know, it's, it's, he's just talked so much. And it, it, it's, um, how do I put it? There, there is something really special when like uh, you see a Jewish person can con convert to Catholicism, especially. And even like a lot of the, the Jewish converts that I hear from, they just say like, there's something very natural about the Catholic church, right? The, even the rituals, the idea, the, the sacrifice mm -hmm. and all that. Um, right. Yeah, I mean. Right. In particular, right. So that's something, again, where the Catholic and the Orthodox um, are in much greater continuity with Israel mm -hmm. than the Protestant denominations, precisely recognizing that in the church, there, Jesus hasn't put an end to sacrifice, which was such a central part of Israel's life. We tend to forget that, right? Because mm -hmm. Israel today, with the temple destroyed, um, can't make sacrifice because sacrifice has to be made in the temple. And the, with the temple destroyed, and um, Judaism conserves the memory of who's from the priestly line, right? In the name Cohen, Khan, Kagan. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in order to exercise that priestly ministry of sacrifice, there needs to be a temple. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the church, that sacrificial element, that's the center of the church's life, mm -hmm. holy mass, right? And it's meant to be the center of the life of all the members of the new covenant. And in that priestly worship. And so one sees the continuity so much more there. All right, Dr. Feingold, here's my last question. And I think you, you've been dying to just answer this one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what, where does uh, Mary, daughter of Zion, as you put it, where does she fit into all this? Wow. Yeah, so she's right at the heart of this mystery, obviously. So the mission of Israel and of Mary coincide. Right? And we said the mission of Israel was to be the people prepared by God in, for his entrance into human history, space, and time. And so God did that preparation in a way that proper to God and maybe the way that I wouldn't have done, right? I tend to rush through everything. But so God prepared for that 2,000 years earlier, calling Abraham, right? And then all of, the whole history of Israel all of its institutions, including the exile, that too was part of the preparation, that humiliation, that increasing of desire, a purification. So all of Israel's history of preparation, um, all of her means for sins being forgiven, all of that increase in growth and revelation. But in order for that to happen, right, that got to be, there needs to be a mother in that people. And so that particular mother in the Church of Faith, right, is precisely Mary, Miriam. And there's a, a, a many places in the Old Testament where it speaks of um, the people of Israel in a personified way as 
the daughter of Zion, right? Mm -hmm. The daughter of Jerusalem, the daughter of Israel. For example, the um, Sephaniah and um, rejoice, daughter of Jerusalem. And, and those the words that Mary hears at the incarnation, hail, right? That's rejoice. Um, precisely that prophetic um, image of um, the daughter of Zion um, who's called to rejoicing. And why? Because your king is coming in your midst, right? And so that's realized precisely in one mother of Israel. So we could say that Mary's mission and Israel's are the same, right? They coincide to be um, the family in whom and in the body, right? In the case of his mother, in, in whom God comes to Israel, to his people, to dwell in the midst. So Mary is crucial. And just as God prepared Israel in such remarkable ways in with his sacramental, you know, sacraments of the old covenant, with revelation, with the worships, with the patriarchs, the prophets, David, the Davidic kingship, it makes sense that he wouldn't fail to prepare that mother in Israel. So she would have been prepared with all of those gifts of the old covenant, right? So she would have been prepared with knowledge of revelation, but above all, the interior gifts of wisdom, understanding, right? The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, so that she understood those that revelation through the interior teacher. And then, but we know that sin is what is contrary to that, right? Sin makes us blind and dull and unable to see. And so it makes sense that she who would be the tabernacle of the word incarnate would be completely purified, completely at enmity with the serpent, right? According to Genesis 3.15, such that, what would that mean? Completely in enmity with the serpent, such that he never had any dominion over her. All, right. All of us, Satan, even though we've been freed by baptism, right? And we come into this world in such a way that we don't have sanctifying grace. We have original sin and Satan has a certain power over us through that. He's in some way and we're um, the has a certain dominion through our lack of grace um, until he's expelled, right? By baptism and the Lord takes possession. So it's fitting that she who would be his mother in Israel would have been perfectly purified, right? From the very start of her existence. And that's what Catholics understand by the Immaculate Conception, right? That she be prepared in a unique way as Israel was prepared, but in a higher way because she's completing Israel's mission, right? So this is, again, I think we tend to think that Israel, because not all Israel um, came to believe in Christ, that Israel failed in her mission. No, right? Israel succeeded in her mission be through Mary, right? Mary, enabled, and in a way that obviously, um, I mean, it's God's work. He's the one who purified her in the Immaculate Conception, but she had to cooperate with it. She cooperated with it in her fidelity, living Israel's life to the full, such that she's properly the daughter of Israel, meaning by that living Israel's life more perfectly than anyone living Israel's faith, living Israel's desire, right, for the Messiah, living that messianic expectation. And, and so, yes, she um, enables Israel to be victorious so that her king comes in her midst. Right? That's Mary's virginal conception. And the king comes in the midst, and then she follows him, right? She accompanies him throughout his life in an intimacy with them, which is our model, right? So um, all of us need to look to them, Mary, the daughter of Zion, um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, to um, ask her to intercede for us, right? To aid us so that we can come to share some of her intimacy with him. Um, so she had an intimacy far greater than that of the 12 apostles, right? They were with him for three years, she was with them for his whole life, right? Mm -hmm. And even the nine months before. And then they fled at the crucifixion, except for John, but she was there, right? And so Mary, the daughter of Zion, um, is present also precisely at the hour, right? Where um, Jesus fulfills his mission in sacrifice, and she is able to um, have the role of Abraham, as it were. So in the sacri so Abraham's faith, right? And Abraham is our father in faith because of his faith in God's promise and his faith at the sacrifice of Isaac. Mary is our model in faith much more. Her faith 
at the Annunciation. Right? So she had to believe that in her womb, this would happen. Israel's expectation would come to pass in her body. Right? Again, it's easy, in some way, it's easy for us to believe because we're somewhat believing abstractly. But the, the glory of faith, the highest moment of faith in all of human history is Mary's faith at the Annunciation. Right? Yes, let it be done to me here and now. All right, that, but an even greater act of faith was on Calvary to see the apparent antithesis of everything she had come to hear at the Annunciation and come mm -hmm. to believe that this in fact is the Davidic King who will rule over the tribes of Jacob forever. And here he is nailed to the cross. And so she believing then is like Abraham, right? Believing at the sacrifice, but Abraham was spared. Mary wasn't spared. And she was called to offer her son. And by consenting to his being sacrificed for us. And in doing this, she's the model of our participation in the Eucharist. And so at every mass, we should ask for her aid to offer him to the father as she did and offer ourselves because she so offering him to the father she was offering herself her entire heart and being and that was he was her whole heart and being in life and so she was offering everything that was herself and her heart in that offering and so that's our model so mary is the daughter of zion and the mother of the church and she's the mother of the eucharist she's the mother of the messiah the mother of the eucharist and the mother of the christian life mm -hmm. right and so right at the on Calvary, Jesus gave um, her to John. Right? So he also gave John to her. And in other words, he was providing for his mother. That's, but he was much more providing for John than he was providing for his mother. And so he says, first, woman, behold your son. And John took her into his own. Right? And so Mary, um, um, we're to take her into our own so that we can live in precisely this union, right? This unity, old and new. So Mary's the perfect image. She's the daughter of Zion of the Old Testament. She inherits, she fulfills all of Israel's mission. She becomes the mother of the Messiah and the mother of the church, the mother of the Eucharist and the sacramental life, the mother of faith. And, and so she holds the two testaments together in that beautiful way. Um, at the, um, and yes, yeah, so she and Mary um, has such an important place in the life of every Christian, but um, in a beautiful way, um, she right, she shows Israel's um, victory, right through her um, collaboration in the divine plan. Yeah. yeah, well, Dr. Feingold, I think you knocked it out of the park there. Uh, I really, yeah, I just you know, there's so many thoughts that one could have you know, just when you talked about Mary being the, uh, the mother of the Eucharist, right? Like in my last episode I did on my channel, it was on transubstantiation. I had Father Thomas Joseph White and Gavin uh -huh. Kerr, and I chose uh -huh. uh, the image in the thumbnail was a painting of Mary adoring the Eucharist, you know, and it's just like, I, I couldn't have picked a better one, given what you've said now. Right. Um, well, that's all by uh, God's grace. One thing there? Yeah, sure. John, yeah. John Paul II has a beautiful section on that in his mm. last encyclical on the Eucharist, it claims to the Eucharistia kind of following Mary as our way of um, coming to, to um, uh, have awe before the mystery of the Eucharist, right? Because it, in some way it encapsulates her whole life. And the last years, decades of her life would have been a Eucharistic hidden life in which her mm. whole life would have been living the mystery of the Eucharist day by day. Wow. Dr. Feingold, thank you so much. Uh, before we end the episode, are, I mean, are you working on anything right now? Is there something that we, is there like a, give it, I don't think you have a channel, maybe a blog or? No, no I don't have that. But um, <laughs> the Association of Hebrew Catholics, mm -hmm. um, I have a number, um, 16 or 17 lecture series there. And um, we did a series on the sacraments that corresponds to um, my book on the sacraments, Touched by Christ. And mm -hmm. um, so this is, by the way, there's a chapter here on the sacraments of the old covenant. So we spoke about that in this interview. And this is published by Emmaus Academic. Um, and I also have a book on the Eucharist, um, also published by Emmaus Academic, mm -hmm. um, Mystery of Presence, Sacrifice, and Communion. Um, 
And so there's a lecture series that's free um, on this, um, on the um, sacraments, the sacramental economy. And I'm currently doing one on um, Christ, the, the Messiah of Israel, as I mentioned earlier. And it's um, every other Sunday, um, there's a, a free Zoom lecture and anybody, is, um, anybody can come on it and you can ask questions mm -hmm. and it's free. Um, and you can find all that information at the website of the Association of Hebrew Catholics. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, and I'll, I'll include that in the description. <laughs> and also, I looked at your book, uh, Touched by Christ, uh, the Sacramental Economy one, mm -hmm. and I'm like, 848 pages. <laughs> that's an epic one. <laughs> yeah, so it's, I use this in my seminary course on yeah. interruption of the sacraments, but if, it's a little hard to get through the whole book in that one course. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Feingold, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a great pleasure to be on.